Welcome to Hard Talk with me, Zainab Badawi, from the World Economic Forum in Davos. My guest is humanitarian activist and Hollywood actor Forrest Whitaker. He's probably best known for his Oscar-winning role 10 years ago as the Ugandan dictator Idi Amin in The Last King of Scotland. And he's remained deeply involved with Uganda through his work with the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, which helps young people living in communities affected by violence across several continents. He's also a special envoy for UNESCO and a member of the UN's advocacy group on sustainable development goals. But can celebrity activists like him be real agents for change? Okay. Forrest Whitaker, welcome to Hard Talk. Oh, it's great to be here with you. Now, in your acting career, mm -hmm. you've been a very, very versatile actor. Mainstream popular films like Rogue One, the Star mm. Wars story, and mm. also the great debaters back in 2007 about black students striving for equality. Mm -hmm. Do you like to act in a, you know, any genre of films? It's, it's, I'm trying to continue to grow as a person. So each character is an opportunity for me to understand a different part of myself, a different part of humanity. And so what happens is that I don't necessarily repeat the same roles because I'm continuing to search to understand and deepen who I am as a person and an artist. Do you believe that film can really create a dialogue and help bring about change? Because you're a very committed social activist, and for mm -hmm. instance, you've been in rather gritty roles. You played a gay character in Preta Porter, mm -hmm. and also in two of your films as director, um, which are Waiting to Exhale and Hope Floats. You right. dealt with issues such as divorce, abandonment, adultery, that kind of thing. I mean, I think that we hope the film can like lend a lens or a mirror to, to uh, our inner thoughts and our inner understandings. I think that I've done a, a number of films. We have, I have a production company, and we do uh, produce films. A lot of those films are with first-time filmmakers, uh, unique individual voices. Uh, we did one a few years ago called Fruitvale Station with uh, uh, Ryan Coogler that uh, Nina, Nina Yang did with me. And um, that film was dealing with Oscar Grant and his being murdered in the uh, BART station in San Francisco. Uh, whereas I've done comedies where I've introduced, uh, like Linda Mendoza, she did something called Chasing Poppy. And that was her first film, but it, you know, just supporting these new voices and supporting her as a filmmaker and as a, and as a female filmmaker. Mm. But do you think that um, your films can kind of um, act as a catalyst to generate debate and perhaps to you know, bring about change in mindsets? Uh, certainly, I think that it, as the, the film I was talking about was, was put out during the, you know, at the conclusion of the trials of, you know, uh, that were going on with Trayvon Martin. Um, I think um, the films that we did before, I, we did a film uh, on Vietnamese refugees that, that created a new dialogue uh, with a director named Tim Bowie uh, about what, what had happened when they were here right. in the United States during that time. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of the films, that, like even the butler as an artist, as an actor, mm -hmm. um, and let you delve into the dialogue of, of uh, race and understanding and, and uh, right. the movement or the growth of the entire country. I think it was, it was just a, a, a dialogue about what had happened during the country's time and what it was reaching for, the sort of sense of life, liberty, mm. and pursuit of happiness. You, are, you, you won numerous accolades, awards, including Oscar for Best Actor when you, for your portrayal as Idi Amin, the um, Ugandan dictator in The Last King of Scotland. Is that a film you're proud of? Yes, I, I, it, I, I gained a lot from that film as an artist and as a person. Uh, I had to do so much research to try to understand this particular character. Um, I, I had never been to the African continent up until that point. That was an uh, opening for me. And, and I had been charged with the notion of, that I was from there. So I needed to understand what it felt like in some ways to actually be African, not African-American. You know, and that was a challenge. The challenge of understanding the historical relevance of what was going on with him during that time and, and all the countries in that region, you know, and the attacks that were going to him, the colonialism, all these things were opportunities for me to continue to, to grow. I had to learn a new language. I was working on Kiswahili so I could actually speak in the film in that language and be able to improvise a little bit, you know, in the language. Uh, to learn mus musical instruments, because uh, uh, that was one of his things. I mean, it was like a party in a box, this uh, accordion that he was playing. But 
it uh, allowed him to create a party wherever he went. You know, and mm. there were certain qualities of his personality that were interesting. Very taxing role. You had to put on 50 pounds, didn't you, to take the role on, something like that. <laughs> you must have been eating a lot, Forrest, in the run-up to that. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and during that time, during mm. that time, I just kept eating. <laughs> so as an African-American going to the continent of Africa for the first time yeah. um, for the film about 2006, 2000, 2005, 2006, roughly, just briefly, what did you feel like when you first landed in Africa? Did you feel like a sense of that you'd come home? Did you have any kind of I guess I, I acquired a deeper feeling of that the more I was opening myself to understanding things. I, at first you get a general feeling of the air and the place and the people and it was, it was very generous. The Ugandans were very generous to me, you know, and, that I met. And, but then something happens as you start to eat the food. You rest it on the sides of a road, riding motorcycles through the streets. Uh, I tried to experience as much as I could to help me understand mm -hmm. how to project this in, tr in a truthful way. You were quoted in the New York Magazine in 2006 saying Idi Amin was responsible for major atrocities, but he also reshaped opportunities for people in his country. He was a person who was colonized and he stood up to colonialism and he was demonized for many things, but partly for standing up. Sounds like you perhaps somewhat admired him. I, I didn't admire the atrocities that he did as far as the, the many deaths. Although if you examine the historical reference, you'll see that the person behind him committed more murders than the person before him has committed more murders. So it doesn't make his right. It just, it's just curious as to why he's, he was so uh, focused on during that time. I think certainly he was trying to bring a sort of sense of nationalism. He kicked out the West, which was unusual for someone who was uh, uh, from the continent. Um, well, did he kick out the West? Because he kicked out a lot of um, Ugandans of Asian origin who lived for many years. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And, and more than that, I'm, it, it, it's, it's not a question of like trying to act like he's like some form of a hero. Uh, it's a question of just like looking at the references and, and seeing the different things that affected the people and changed their sense of identity. And he did like have some influence on changing their identity. You, you said in general about empathizing with characters that once you understand the patterns that shape a person, how can you not find sympathy? Does that apply to somebody like Edie Armin, who, as you say, committed, and we know, many atrocities, you know, extrajudicial killings. We believe that estimates between 100 to 300,000 people mm -hmm. killed, you know, the nepotism, the corruption, and, and all the rest of it. I think, it I think yeah, in, in, in some ways, I guess, even very strongly, uh, because at first you just look, you look at the, what, what is projected of him, and, and you have to try to go to the source of what would make him become that. What would make him commit 300,000 murders? What would, what would allow him to do some of the atrocities that You're occurred? asking for understanding, though, for somebody who was a very brutal dictator. I'm not asking no. for understanding for him. I'm looking for humanity in who he is. I think we have to look at humanity. We have to be able to stand in each other's shoes and understand that the way we behave is based on the different structures or things that happen to us as we, as we grew up in our lives. And so my philosophy as an artist is I look at every character and I try to understand them. I go to their core. I start pulling away the different experiences of their lives, pulling away the different pains, understandings, until I get to the bottom. And at the bottom of it, I believe we are all connected in some way. At the bottom, there's just a flame that is connected to everybody. And then you put those things back up on top of that character, that person, and that forms him. And then you can see a person who did atrocities, who did horrible things, but you do try to go for understanding. Look at the, pe the perceptions that um, that film raised about Africa. I want to tell you what a black British writer and film critic Vanessa Waters wrote in The Guardian. She said the fact that Armin killed many of his people, does that give carte blanche to the filmmakers to play to some of the worst stereotypes of corrupt, murderous, incompetent and ridiculous black leaders? Africa is presented as a place of violence and superstition ruled by fear. How far do you believe that's true and if so, does it worry you? I mean, I think that certainly I, because the, the the continent is really diverse. And so there's all different types of stories, and many of those stories need to be told, you know, uh, from different, different ways of life, different types of characters who, who, make up, who make up that continent. But I think that if you look at historically, like this particular character and what he did in his life and the things that happened, um, then you, you, you have to like deal with the truth of what that is. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, because I think this movie was somewhat about colonialization and what, what colonization would do, did. And, and, and I think that was looking at, painting that picture of, that he was created. He was a soldier who was famous for fighting with the Mau Mau's mm -hmm. and they took him. He wasn't choosing to be a president. They took him and 
said, here's this opportunity here. We'd like you to become president. We will use you as a puppet to, to deal with our means. But unfortunately for them, he chose not to okay. take that but It doesn't path. play into the negative stereotypes of Africa, which is the point that Vanessa Waters is making. Do you accept I can, that there's I a kernel of truth in that? I can say that it does it play into that? I think that it plays in this particular story. I think it's, it's, it's to be staying, trying to stay pretty true to what was occurring during that time. The things you were talking about. When you were referencing Idi Amin, you said all kinds of atrocities. You had no sympathy for him. You were discussing all these things and asking me how I could have any feeling about him. That was your point of view. Yeah, that was. Yeah, you know, so, so, I'm saying, so I'm saying that, yes, that, that that may exist. And I think, yes, more stories need to be told you know, that deal with the African diaspora and the, and the deal with the African continent that like show the, the uplifting stories, that show the lives, the joys and all things like that. That's one of, one of many stories. It's just one of many stories. One other aspect, um, just to finish on that film, that's interesting. So there's Idi Amin, this big figure in Africa, ruled between 1971 to 79 and, you know, made quite an impression globally. But what does the film tell us about Hollywood? Because the story is related through the eyes of a young Scottish doctor who hmm. goes to Uganda. Tell you what the veteran film producer, Joe Picciarallo, says in general. The bottom line is that the major studios want assurances that film projects, projects have the potential to attract a significant white audience. Um, so they've got to go through the eyes of a white sure. doctor. I mean, I think in... in I think that has been the case in different times and, and continues to be that way at certain times. Um, in the case of that, it was based on a book, you know? Um, and so it was following that particular book. But um, As I a think, general point, though, yeah, as a general it's, point, it's valid? At times, it's been extremely valid. I think it's, it continues to be... I mean, we're looking at a, a system where 13% of the leading characters in films, minorities, uh, are, are you know, people of color. Uh, but... In reality, there's 40 percent of our population is that. So there's a mm. disparity, and so there's this question of economy. There's a question of why you make what film you make, and sometimes I think we've we've the studios themselves have made this assumption that uh, in order to make a film be successful, in order to make the monies that they need to make, they needed to have a, a, a white protagonist or. It, 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 yeah, I mean, I would put to you some, some figures. In 90 years of the history of the Academy Awards, under 15 men and women of colour have received Oscars for Best Actors. And as you know, in 2015, 2016, there were no nominations for black or, or you know, non-white actors, and that made directors like Spike Lee and other people boycott the, the, the Oscars. Have you received short shrift? in Hollywood, do you think, as a result of your colour? Or are you just one of the success stories who's uh, swum against the tide? Um, I think in the first part of your, your, your uh, statement, I think certainly there are disparities that have happened, you know, with, with artists who have not been recognised for their work at times. You know, um, and I think it's, it's still being worked on. It's even being worked on by the Academy to make it more inclusive, to make more, uh, more people of color, different people from different cultural backgrounds or different languages come together. Uh, for myself, um, it's difficult because I had a particular reason why I was becoming an artist. At the time when I was becoming an artist, I was using it as a, as a window for me to be able to understand humanity in some way. So even if I had roles, it might not make me satisfied. I might be doing something that everyone would loud and say was great, but maybe it didn't create a great individual journey for me. Mm. Now, I've had the opportunity to have really, really interesting journeys in different characters and stuff. Perhaps it's atypical at times um, and becoming more typical, you know? But I, mean? I want to ask you about that because one um, role that you did take was you played a cop in A Policeman in the TV series The Shield. And uh, you grew up, you were born in Texas, but you moved to LA when you were four years of age and you lived in a fairly segregated neighborhood. And you talked about how you saw acts of police brutality, even against members of your own family and friends and so on and so forth. So then how did you feel about acting the, the role of a policeman? Again, I, I think each time it's an opportunity to try to like understand more about that situation, understand more about myself, understand more about people. So if I'm playing a police officer, I get the opportunity to walk in their shoes to try to understand their purview and, and, and understand that that particular person individually. Um, it's not, I can't say it's uh, difficult to play a police officer. Maybe I have certain 
reactions to police officers personally, you know, because of experiences that I've had. Maybe it like may put a charge inside of me at, at times because of things I've seen or because of the way I was brought up. You know, um, that's still things that I'm working mm -hmm. on as a, as a human being. Um, but playing the character was another opportunity to try to understand humanity. And for me, that is the goal. That's the goal. But I mean, we've seen obviously the Black Lives Matter campaign and uh, even big stars like you are, uh, for instance, I'm thinking of the uh, case when in 2013 you walked into a New York deli and uh, you were wrongly accused of, of shoplifting and you, yeah, you were stopped and frisked. And so yeah. yeah, you were stopped and frisked. Yeah. I mean, what does that tell us about race in America today? I mean, certainly, I mean, we're, ex we're looking at all the, um, talking about Black Lives Matter, talking about what, what sort of came out of as a, as a uh, statements of, you know, about, against what was happening and occurring inside of many different communities where people of color were being harmed or hurt um, by, by state officials or police, you know what I mean? And, and, and profiling that goes on with them in the stop and frisk movement and stuff. It makes a statement about, you know, the nation and how far we still need to go. I mean, certainly, um, I think a young black teenager, young black teenager is like 20 times more likely to be killed than his white counterpart. So certainly we have things that we need to be working on, mm. you know? You campaigned for um, Barack Obama in his presidential bid, and you said back in 2008, I can feed a tide of change in the country. Did it come? I think that, the, that there is still a tide of change. I mean, to try to act like we haven't had great progress is, you know, as a nation and as culturally is, is not true. I mean, we coming from a situation where originally we came to the nation as slaves. Now the head of our country, I mean, the country, the president was President Obama. It's a long journey. So to act as if we haven't yeah, moved but, anywhere is... But is he a, himself said in his... It doesn't um, mean we won't have places to go. Sure. Like, like well, I think as Martin Luther King was, was saying, you know, that we're, we're owed, we have a promissory note that's been, that's been given to us. That promissory note was for life, liberty, and happiness. We have not achieved that. So until we truly achieve that, then we haven't become the America that we say we want to be. We're ne we, we have not living up to our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence. Mm. We're, not, we're not living in that. But he didn't that. do very well on race, did he? I mean, even in his final speech as President Barack Obama said, after my election, there was talk of a post-racial America. Such a vision, however well-intended, was never realistic, for race remains a potent and often divisive force in our society. The the fact that there was this first African-American president didn't really change things on the ground, did it? And in that it, sense, it he mean failed. That is, he it, failed. Like, no, I don't, I don't think he failed in that respect. I think he moved forward a conversation. He moved forward an understanding. It changes the psyche of, of the nation and the psyche of, in some ways, the world. You know, I, I, Like I say, we're working, working on making those things stronger. Mm. You know what I mean? But to act like he, he, he hasn't succeeded, and to act like that doesn't exist, and to act like there isn't some success is, is incorrect, because it's, it's the truth. So Donald Trump, of course, uh, in the White House, and 88% of African Americans who voted in the presidential election voted for Hillary Clinton. Only 8% of them voted for Donald Trump. Does that worry you, then, that he's not going to be a president for all Americans, in particular African Americans? I mean, it, it certainly remains to be seen. I'm, I'm hopeful, I mean, that he's going to be a president in the end who represents all the constituency, who represents the, the people of all cultures, races, uh, of sexual preference, of, you know, immigrants. Of you optimistic about that? Optimistic? I can't be optimistic based on some of the statements that have been made. I'm just... Which I'm statements worry in particular? Well, there's, there's a lot of statements, okay. you know. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? There are loads, I mean, yeah. Right. yeah. So, so, and, and, and so uh, there's concerns, but, but then we have to come to the table and try to like, find some common ground and hopefully push forward the agenda. It doesn't people, look good, though, does it? I mean, he's taken a swipe at what he's called liberal Hollywood. We saw the attack he made on Meryl Streep after she criticised him at the Golden Globes Awards. Uh -huh. So he he's, doesn't like liberal Hollywood. Is, is that going to include you, isn't it? I, I, I mean, I, it, it won't stop me from doing the, the work in the manner in which I've been doing it for years and continuing to try to strive forward. I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we will be able to be a nation that's, you know, mm. united. Right now, we've been in a nation that's polarized. And before that, we had, like, a lot of questions. And, and, and there's a, not a lot of, I think there's a lot of people who are doubting that we're going to move forward, uh, and, you know, but 
in a positive way. But we have to try to push it forward. And if it doesn't happen, then the people themselves have to stand up and speak. If it doesn't happen, if they're not being respected, not being treated well, have not, their needs are not being met, then they have to stand up, whether that's in protests, movements, marches, however, mm. to make their voices be heard. What is more important to you, your work as an actor or as a humanitarian activist? I mean, my work is, you know, humanitarian work is, is particularly important to me. Uh, I think at the kernel of it, I'm always trying and striving to, to understand humanity and make sure that I see myself in others. Mm -hmm. And if I see myself in someone else and they're struggling and suffering, then uh, I'd like to take up that uh, mantle to try to heal that. Your Peace and Development Initiative works a great deal with young people affected by violence, in particular um, young people, children who were forced to work as, or to, to fight as child soldiers, which of course we've seen in uh, Uganda as well, as well as other parts of the world. But how can you fi fix that aspect of a much, much bigger problem by just addressing this one thing? And, and are you having one much thing success meaning, with child soldiers? Uh, I, don't, I don't address it just by dealing with child soldiers. I've been working with child soldiers. There's 250,000 child soldiers in the world, you know. I, I, I started working initially in Uganda with child soldiers. We started working in the South Sudan on our Youth Peacemaker Network to deal with you know, uh, peace and reconciliation and development. And so we've been training youth in that way. We started first in uh, Jongli State because we thought maybe the conflict might happen there. And we wanted to help, hopefully help stabilize the country if it did. And it did happen, and that was the place where the conflicts happened. But the youth that we had trained all acted as like a sort of early warning system to help each other get to safety. So that was very powerful, and that's what they, they did and but continue to do. What I meant is, you know, it's developing these countries is such a huge, huge problem. You can help the young people, but, you know, where are the jobs for them? Even if you get them an education, quality education, there's no gainful employment for them and so on. So, I mean, it must make you feel very frustrated that despite your huge efforts, you still sometimes see that there isn't as much change on the ground as you would like. Um. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, look, when you deal with a situation like in South Sudan where people are being, you know, um, the, the civil war has been going on for a long time. There's 50,000 deaths. There's, I don't know, 2.9 million people displaced. One million people displaced. A million are refugees and yeah. two internally displaced. And, you know, the United Nations mm -hmm. is saying that uh, five million people are don't have enough food and are in need of humanitarian exactly. assistance. This I mean, exactly. that's nearly half the population. But, but are, we, are we to not, like, try to, to move things forward and help the equation? Because those those atrocities. Of course, you help, but yeah, I'm saying, no, but I'm, saying feel, yeah. I'm saying that what we what we've done is is uh, worked with the youth, training them in that area. Those youth that went out into the community and trained others in those areas, and and in our space, you know, because because as you say, it is a really difficult situation, but they have managed to be able to help during the situation as peace builders, as peace mediators. I mean, one of our youths like went to uh, get the army to move out of a school in order to bring these children back inside. He was able to accomplish that. Another of our youth has been working on policy. He was accepted as a member of parliament. A lot of these different things are going on. They're like all these development projects that they're still doing, even during this time, of really major atrocities and different difficulties well, that are going on. A lot of worries about South Sudan, as you say. You have met uh, President Salva Kiir of South Sudan and also his erstwhile deputy, Riek Machar, who now leads the Sudan People's Liberation Movement in opposition, the main rebel leader. Mm -hmm. The rivalry between them is so personal. There are those who argue that there will be no peace in South Sudan until both men are no longer on the scene acting politically. Um, I don't know. I think, I think that you know, recently, I think it was in December, uh, they, 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 they started a, a dialogue for reconciliation in sure. the country. And I'm national hoping that it will be inclusive, this national dialogue. Uh, and that everyone be, will be included and they'll be able to move through it and talk through it. And otherwise, you know, uh, there are a lot of players who are trying to help people find common ground to be able to deal with the situation. It's like any other situation that, of this magnitude. Can activists like you really be agents for change? I mean, I think that we all can be agents of change if we, like, decide to stand up for certain things. Certainly, like, I've been working in this area. We have thousands of views in the protection of civilian camp that we work with, 3,000, I believe, at the moment. You know, we are about to do into a refugee camp where we'll be working with about 10,000 people. So certainly we're dealing with the situation, um, building 
you know, uh, community learning centers across that, that state and stuff, in, in Eastern Equatoria State. So certain things are, are happening. It, it, like, and, and during this time of difficulty, during this time of really painful uh, recognitions. Forrest Whitaker, thank you very much indeed for coming on Hard Talk. Sure. Thank you. <laughs>